Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm very excited. Um, webinar Wednesday, once again. And today we get to do something a little bit different, a little, I'm excited about it because I don't know anything about it. And I'm very excited to um, announce or introduce uh, someone that I really like his work and I'm very excited for him to come share it with us. So uh, good afternoon, Huckleberry. Thank you for joining me today. Hey, Sprite, how are you today? I'm very good. So, Huckleberry, you are the, um, are you the owner of Robin Hill or? Uh, my wife and I own the business. It's a textile business, uh, but my side is separate from what she's doing. Okay, well, fantastic. And, um, and so what are you going to be doing for us today? Well, uh, today uh, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about chain stitch embroidery which is uh, on two machines that I have that are each over 100 years old. They're hand controlled. And how I use dye sublimation, bringing sort of some new techniques from that side of my studio into this, you know, 100 year old plus technique of embroidery. Well, I am very excited to learn. Um, your sales rep, Kylie, who's a very good friend of mine, you made her this absolutely fantastic jacket. Um, that I'm really, really jealous of. So, uh, <clears throat> so uh, maybe you'll have to, um, you know, make me something. Maybe <laughs> we'll see how it yeah. goes. And let's let's talk off air. I would love to do that. That works. So, um, if you guys have any questions, just ask them in the chat, either on YouTube or Facebook. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, and you can show us the magic that you do. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, well, what I thought I would do is just, I've got a couple different stations set up in my studio, and I thought what I would do is first talk a little bit about the machine that's sort of at the middle of it all and what it does, and then uh, show how I'm using the die sub to support that. So I'm just going to turn the camera a little bit. This machine right here is my main workhorse, and this is a Singer. Um, it's a 114W103 is the model number, chain stitch embroidery machine. And essentially the way this works is the, the sewing head here is controlled by a handle that's under this table. And as I rotate the handle, you can see here that the sewing head rotates as well. So whatever orientation I put this handle in, that's the direction that the machine stitches. Uh, you have a control of needle height and tension and distance between the stitches, but those are pretty much your only adjustments. Uh, also, this machine doesn't have a bobbin like a uh, modern sewing machine would. It has one continuous piece of thread. And at the end, I'll get under the table and I can really show people how it works. But just as an overview, essentially what I'm going to do is uh, just take this piece of felt and by pushing the motor under here, I've got my uh, servo that controls the speed. And you can see that by just moving around, I can, uh, let me get the camera down in here a little bit. Okay. So you can see that the stitching here follows the direction of the handle that's under the table. What this allows me to do is uh, write and basically draw, or, or as we talk about it as often, is essentially tattooing on the fabric. So the ways in which that we use this would be um, something like, this is a, a vest that I did for myself. And if you look at that, that is all thread that's all been stitched onto a piece of felt and then sewn on this jacket. And uh, 
an H lowly worm on the front. And the way that I use dye sublimation to make these designs is to essentially take this uh, felt and I dye sub the ink right on there and that gives me the pattern as well as the color registration so that as I'm sewing, especially in complex patterns, I can see exactly where the colors should be. Uh, otherwise you end up making uh, a large template and maybe numbering things. There's a lot of different ways that people keep track of their colors when they're working. Um, this is another jacket that I'm working on for a customer. This is a more traditional way of working where this is actually um, some stabilizer, some sewing stabilizer, and I've run it through my laser printer and just printed the design directly on the stabilizer and I'm stitching through it. And then at the end, I'll tear all this away and weed it basically. And then the thread will stay directly on the jacket. In this case, I'm using this technique because I can't dye sub directly onto this garment. But if I'm doing one that has a patch on it instead, then I would do that directly on the patch. Uh, I've got some other products kind of up here on the table I'll just pull down. This is actually a, a piece that's on the back of my rep Kylie's jacket. And here I was just trying some different patterning with my fill. Uh, the way that you actually get these large color blocks, I'm sure the camera's not really going to pick this up very well, is that you do concentric circles. So, for example, in order for this to be a solid red stripe, I put my red thread in, I outline that box, and then I make a circle at the beginning, and then I move over one thread width and make another circle, and then over and over and over and over again. And that's what gives you the solid fill pattern. So uh, here, let's see if I can get this light on here. Maybe this will shine in the thread a little bit. You can kind of see it there. So this is just circle after circle after circle that generates, here's the back. And that's how you do the fill pattern and do the drawing. Um, this is another piece, same kind of thing, where I just die subbed onto uh, the scrim felt and scrim felt is is a, a thicker felt than like a, a hobbyist or a craft felt. It's more rigid. It's almost like a cardboard, and it's in between a hobbyist and uh, like a Condi FP22, uh, which is the thicker felt. Um, I actually have a couple samples of that right here. Uh, this is the FP22 from Condi, and um, you can see how thick this is. This went through the machine. So what I actually did, uh, a friend of mine that's a pilot, I designed these um, little coasters, live TV, including this one, which is a uh, Pan American, didn't actually exist. I took the napkin and the logo and kind of mashed them together and then just stitched uh, the airplane with the paper airplane with the shadow of his airplane on it uh, on this FP-22. And this was a nice product because I could actually um, with the die sub, since the image is going to stay on there, I could use these as a coaster. So that's the way in which I'm kind of mashing them together. And I started doing this about four or five months ago, simply because I hate weeding so much. And quickly I realized what a great tool it was, uh, both for layout and color registration. And just as a time saver, frankly, because I'm not having to do an intermediate product between my finished product and the machine. Um, some of the other things that I've worked on, uh, these are, uh, customers are doing a lot with banners right now, which are really hot. And so these are some banners and starting with this one, which is the by the yard sublo linen. This is the JDW 755. And this is just a straight up, so I get that light back over here. This is just a straight up die sub print that I have, uh, just sewn some bias tape on the end. And uh, so that's the sort of starting point. This is a second version. This is my logo where I've actually gone in and chain stitched the letter. And then on the back side, I've actually used die sub to put a logo on the back of it, which is a great way to brand the back of these banners. Um, the color saturation is so good on this sublo linen. And ironically, the weave of it is so tight that it doesn't affect the needle. 
So typically these needles are almost like a crochet hook. So they don't do well with knits. And so when it pulls back up, a lot of times it snags the fabric and you can start to unweave what you're working on. But the subtle linen, because it has that built-in backing on it, is perfect for sewing. Uh, even just regular sewing is great. Uh, so this is an intermediate option that I've been doing for customers where they can't afford to pay for a banner that is fully embroidered, but you can get something that looks really cool with an embroidery touch on it. Um, and then this is a fully embroidered. And again, this entire logo is die subbed onto the sub linen and then stitched over and... Uh, you know, this light is killer, but um, there you go. You can see the fill pattern a little bit on that skull. Again, just circle, circle, circle. Um, but it gives a really distinct looking product that aren't a lot of people in the market doing it right now. Then again, I've got a logo on the back. And uh, this is an open, a two-sided opened and closed sign that I did for a local store. Again, just sub linen that's been die subbed and actually the top, I didn't stitch. Again, a cost savings for them. So the bottom word is chain stitch and the top I did in a font that looks like chain stitch, but isn't embroidered. Um, this is uh, something I worked on today and I thought I'd put on the machine. I can show a little bit more about the fill pattern. I wanted to do a thank you note uh, for being on the show today. So this is actually, again, scrim felt and you can see the stiffness of the felt. And uh, this is my text print DT. Here is the, uh, the paper. And then so you can see that on this, I actually just even did the script right on there. Uh, my handwriting is terrible, but my wife laughs that my handwriting is better on the embroidery machine than it is with a pencil. So uh, sometimes I'll just freehand it. On this one, I was a little short on time, so I just went ahead and, and cheated and put that right on. And so this is another product where I can do a somewhat complex logo of a customer and not have to translate it too much because I can put it right on there. Some people will do vellum or paper where they'll actually draw things and then stitch over that. But for me, I find it much faster and more accurate to just go ahead and bring it up in the Adobe Suite, either Illustrator or Photoshop, and then just print it out directly onto Dysub and put it right on my final product. It's great because I don't have to worry about, even if, if it's laundered, I don't have to worry about it uh, fading, peeling, cracking, no running. Uh, some people do uh, pens or markers or chalking and all of that stuff has to be cleaned off. And that's just another step, which means a reduction in my profit at the end of the day. So that's kind of a general overview. Hey, Huck, and, real, real quick, I do have a question about the sure. sublo linen that you use. So Denise yeah. wants to know, do you do the bulk sublo linen by the yard? Yeah, the number I wrote down, uh, and if I can do a condi.com pro tip, I was talking to Kylie today and saying, I have the hardest time finding the fabric by the yard. And she pointed out that next to the search bar, there's a red drop-down menu, which I don't know why I've never noticed it before. It's bright red. Uh, if you click on that, there's actually a tab that says uh, the fabric by the yard. I learned something today. Yes, uh, we, I am, I am uh, always working to improve the website. Um, so, <laughs> but yes. Yeah, it, was, it was one of those things. It's so obvious I should have seen it, but I'm just, I've always used the other menu on the menu bar. So anyway, yeah, this is the JDW755, which is the sub linen by the yard. Um, I started off using the placemats because they're double-sided. And I was doing, actually, that's what a couple of the banners were because I thought I would do a time savings by buying the, the mat, being able to print both sides, and then just cutting a little swallowtail at the bottom and edge banding it. So if you're trying to do something that's a little bit of a time savings, then those place mats is a, a great option because it's the same material and it's already stitched together. Um, but the by the yard, I've gone to that because my shapes started getting too irregular to do those anymore. Um, and the same with the, uh, the FLA-0, which is the 
um, the single ply garden flag. This is another project I just did for a friend of mine. I took a bunch of pictures of his dog, his corgi, and printed that directly onto the flag and then stitched the border and stitched his dog's name in there. It doesn't look great on camera, but in person, the light kind of comes through and it's, it's a nice product. I really like that Condi's got a couple different options for me with the flags or modifying the placemats to come up with these small scale banners, either die sub or embroidery. Is that? I think, that's... I think you just taught some people about the red tab also, so. <laughs> Well, it's, it's all Kylie. Kylie taught me that right before the show. <laughs> right so. before the show. Okay. Yeah. I sent her a note and said, I'm trying to find the product number for the Sublo Linen because I know we're going to talk about fabric by the foot and I always just search it, but there's got to be a better way. And she said, yes, it's right there on the red menu. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I was going to go ahead and move over to the machine. Does that work for you, Sprite? Absolutely. That, that's the okay. part I'm excited about. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so I know that I'm, I'm trying not to fumble too much with my camera work, but it's inevitable. So uh, just get bear with me while I uh, slide over there and get the machine set up real quick. So um, sort of anecdote while I'm doing that, the shirt that I have on is... Um, one that's commercially available, but as a kid, I was really obsessed with bowling shirts and vintage Western wear. And that's what got me interested in chain stitch. And it took me years and years to realize that it's a thing, that there's a special machine and there are different kinds of stitches that they used to use versus the computer embroidery that everyone does now. So about a year and a half ago, I realized that this machine existed. Um, and then there aren't that many of them, and there are a few that are made now, but they're, they're pretty rare. Most people don't know about them. So I went down that rabbit hole in forums and different groups to find this machine. And uh, so if you're looking at old sewing machines, the easiest way to tell is, and I'm going to just show you under here real quick, this handle. This is instant giveaway that you're dealing with a chain stitch machine. This is my control handle right here. So as I move this, that's what's moving my stitch head and changing the direction of the stitch. So if you're looking at old sewing machines, because when they get this old, they all look very similar. The handle is the key. All right, so let's see if I can get you uh, down in here. All right. Is that close enough? Is that resolution coming up, Sprite, that you can see this area? Or yes, that's, per up? that's perfect. Okay. All right. So while I'm off camera, I'll slide on my old man glasses here. All right. So basically what I've already done is I've outlined this area in blue, and that's kind of like your warning strip. And then when we do the fill patterns, I personally don't like doing it wider than about um, five eighths, three quarters of an inch max. It's, it's just a personal style. So I've split this in half. So I'm gonna fill one half and then I'm gonna fill the other half. The way that you fill these shapes in is sort of a signature thing. So everyone does it a different way. And it's not, I don't know if you can see it very well. There we go. I did the bottom one where I did one continuous shape and then an irregular shape here. Then the top, I did the opposite way where I went from corner to corner. So the color blocking is the same, but using the thread direction and your stitch technique, you can totally change the way that the shape is. And as an example, just while I'm talking about that, this is my son's uh, Dungeons and Dragons jacket I made for him. And you can see the way that it gets down into each of these horns as its own shape and uh, changes the look of the actual shape, even though what I'm all I'm really trying to do is put down a red color block on a black felt. Okay, so dragging that out long enough, let's actually do some stitching. So I can get the best view for you here, I'll go this way. So first I'm going to just lay down 
circle and then another circle. And these are all just overlapping. And this is about as fast as I would ever go when I'm filling in, just because it's really important that you get all of these threads laying on top of each other and that there are no gaps. So I think you can immediately see that this is not a mass production technique. And that often when I'm working on a big jacket or project, I look over at my die sub printer and just think how fast this would be <laughs> on just to throw it on a vapor shirt real quick. <laughs> Gonna finish up this half and then I'll pull it back out and pull it up to the camera. One of the reasons that uh, chain stitchers use this scrim felt is the thickness of it. And so with a chain stitch machine, it's all about the thread tension. That's the name of the game. And so the way this machine works, as I mentioned, it doesn't have a bobbin. And so it essentially, with that crochet style needle, it pulls the thread up and then it has what's called a looper that is almost like your friend putting your uh, finger on the present that you're wrapping and it holds the thread in place for a second while it goes in to do the next loop. And so if I was to just pull this out of the machine, which maybe I will. If I was just to pull this out right now, I haven't locked the stitch. So every time you finish a line, you have to uh, flip it over and tie off your knots. So you can see my knots here from finishing that. Now you can see, Looking at this, if I pull on this thread, it's just pulling it back out. So it's really just held in place until I cut it and pull it through and tie off that knot. But here now is half of that stitched and then the other half unstitched. So again, you can see how easy it is for me to identify my color area using the die sub. Um, what, what do you think, Sprite? Should I show some other examples of products? I don't know if everybody wants to keep watching me stitch, but I'm happy to do that. Actually, um, um, that is a very satisfying process to watch that get <laughs> stitched. <laughs> well, let me, um, let me see if I can move my camera down because I can't zoom. I can't zoom on Zoom. <laughs> uh, and let me see if I can get really right up in the, uh, so you can actually see what I'm working on. It's, it's incredibly satisfying. There we go. And it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things that you, you start to get in a Zen place with it where you, you're paying attention, but at the same time, you're, you're, you can let your mind wander a little bit. So it's, it's really nice in that way. Just covering back up that part that I pulled out. All right, and then I'm going to uh, come back over and start again at the base of this triangle. So Alice, I... Alice asked, this is a single needle machine, correct? It is, yep. Um, let me see if I can get that. It's a, yeah, it's a single needle machine. Uh, so I think for, Probably a lot of people that are doing die sub and that are on these are probably familiar with computer embroidery, I would think, and, and modern sewing machines. And so unlike modern embroidery, those move side to side and stitch, you know, they can get really fine in the detail. 
this thing, the reason you see so many people on bowling shirts and old Western wear and people that use this technique doing uh, cursive is because every time you have to stop, you have to tie it off. And so if you're doing individual letters, that becomes very, very tedious. So do you have to have a special needle for that machine? Uh, yes, and I have one right here I can show you. It's everything on this machine is special <laughs> in more ways than one. <laughs> um, it, there are a couple, as I mentioned, uh, there are a couple of companies that still make clones of these machines. And there is a uh, Conso is a company that still makes a modern version. But the parts for these, I mean, they're hundred year old machines. It's like working on an old car. If you know the, the supply houses, you can find places to get them. And I'm pulling out, uh, I don't know that you can, there we go, maybe against my shirt. Uh, so you can see it's, it's essentially a needle like you would have on a sewing machine, but rather than a hole, it has a hook. So it's exactly like a crochet needle, except that on the other end is threaded. And so it actually threads into the needle shaft. And I know that we talked about uh, going into the machine at the end, but since we're here, if you want, I can, I can open it up and, and explain more about the machine. Uh, sure, and, and the one that you're working on right now, how old is that one? Um, th approximately, this one I think is technically 97 years old. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so we've all seen old singers and they, they look very similar to this. Um, and again, uh, we're kind of looking under the table. This is my control handle. I've upgraded my machine to a servo motor and there's my throttle control. It's on an old treadle base. And so this is just the, the switch that turns the motor off and on. Here is my thread and the thread comes up and enters this assembly here. This spring and the discs right behind it is my tension assembly. Uh, the tension assembly is two discs that squeeze together, very similar to what you would see on a modern sewing machine. And then this spring, um, it, it takes up the tension as I'm sewing to, to keep a modern, uh, mo a, to monitor the tension at all times. And then it goes up into the machine here, which is the uh, worm gear, which is what's called the looper. And that's essentially your friend's finger that holds it while you're sewing. Um, these machines were originally set up to be in factories and run by belts. So when this machine was put in service, uh, this area here would have had a belt going to the ceiling of the factory. And that belt would have been running continuously. So what you would do if you needed to stop, the handle, you actually has a down motion and you pull it down and it would move this gear that would, it's an interrupter gear that would let the, flea, the flywheel continue to spin, but it would actually stop the sewing machine from sewing. Um, so let me let me take this piece off and I can run it for a second without uh, this wonderful thank you note under here, which I don't want to mess up. So removing, I just ran my finger underneath to give myself a little bit of tension and I'm sliding over. Because it's on this uh, crochet style needle, I just take a hook and essentially pick the thread off of the needle. So at this point, what I need to do is pull, pull some tension because I wanna keep this thread on the finished side of my work. I'm gonna cut it and then slide this away. So when I would be done, I would take this thread with a needle, put it back through the surface and then flip it over and tie it off back here. Then that area would be done. But now that I've got that off, I can um, go ahead and starting down here, 
This is giving it a little, I'm just giving it some power. And you can see the tension assembly and the worm gear drive underneath here. Coming over, here's my handle. This is what I was doing making those circles. And then here we've got the servo motor that's actually driving the machine. Coming up through here, you can see the drive coming from underneath from the servo. Here's the interrupter gear. I have mine disengaged um, just because I'm not running it on a belt. And then those gears that are moving is me turning the handle. So it turns these gears, which comes over here to the sewing head and turns this gear on the end, which controls the direction of my stitching, which looks terrible because I haven't been paying attention. But. And what type of thread are you using? Ah, so materials, that is uh, a great question. Um, you can see here on my thread wall, this is some of it. I use a company Madeira and the company or the type of thread that I use typically is a 40 weight thread and I like a wool blend. Um, so for example, this cone is about $6. I have other types of thread. Um, this is a 15 it's, and it's a varicated. So as you stitch it, it changes all of these colors along your stitch. Um, so there's lots of different things that you can run through this machine and it actually has uh, different size needles and these guides that screw into, I don't know if you can see it, it looks like a funnel. They screw into the sewing head so that as you use different size threads, like almost to yarn really big threads, uh, you would switch them to a different uh, size of that and the, the needle that correspond with each other so that your needle is held tight uh, by that funnel as it's stitching. So you can use almost any kind of thread on this machine within reason. Uh, there are also versions that have attachments that do taping. So especially in like Middle Eastern clothes where you see almost like a piece of rope stitched on in a very decorative way, this same machine can do that also. But Madeira, 40 weight, Bermelana is the wool blend thread that I use the most. I also have uh, this shiny acrylic thread. It's very slippery to embroider with, but it gives you that really cool uh, skating rink kind of jacket or patch. Uh, the same thing on the scrim felt. The scrim felt is from this company uh, in New York, um, Crystal. And these are their basic colors. This company has been in business forever and they pretty much were established just to support varsity jackets. That's who uses these machines still and uses the scrim felt and uses the chenille threads. Um, so they're who I get most of my scrim felt and chenille stuff through. This same machine also does a chenille. Um, I think I've got one right here. So like a, a varsity patch on this machine, we call it moss stitch. It's kind of hard to see in this packaging, but it almost looks like a terry cloth, like a towel, um, but it's the same thing as on a varsity jacket, the letter. And on all you do on the machine is you flip the needle around. And so it's pulling on a different part of the stroke, loosen the tension. And then on my machine, there's a timing button that you switch in the looper. And then it does, instead of doing those tight locked down chains, it pulls these giant loops that stick up above your material and uh, you just group them together and it looks like a, a towel or a small rug. That's awesome. Um, so here's a couple of samples and then I can show you my other machine, which is um, crazy. <laughs> so I'm doing a show this weekend actually. So I just happened to have a bunch of jackets. And so this is a, a kid's jacket that I did. Um, and this is direct embroidery. So you can see if I flip it around, that's all just right through the denim. 
And this was one that I did using that technique with the uh, stabilizer. And this is my daughter's jacket, her Pac-Man jacket. And I found this um, jacket at a, a thrift shop and all of the dots on it just, it reminded me of Pac-Man. And so I thought this would be a really fun jacket to do for her because she really enjoys doing vintage uh, video games. And these are all done using die sub. So I pulled up, this was an early idea I had where I, this is on Scrimfelt with the die sub and I started to make this patch and I decided I, I didn't like the way this would fit on the jacket. So it's another great way that the Scrimfelt's relatively inexpensive. It, it's actually almost the same as the, um, uh, the sub linen. It, it's about $13 a yard. And so you can make some of these things and really lay them out on the garment and decide and you can see because it's in color and it's on the material, is this gonna work? Is it not gonna work? And it's not costing you a lot. Uh, you know, the same thing with the transfer, it's, uh, I'm sure Mr. Gross could break the formula down, but I calculate that it's, it's around a, a dollar uh, and I'll do several pieces on what one eight and a half by 11. And just so that I have a bunch of patches already made and ready to go. Uh, and then the same thing on the back, so this is called a rocker and in the, you know, the, the kind of motorcycle jacket style, this is really common. And what I was doing before is I had a, a French curve and like some fancy rulers and I was cutting these out. Not only this piece, but the red is actually a separate piece of felt. They get sandwiched together to give you that look. But with uh, the die sub, what I actually started doing is making a template in Photoshop that has my cut line on it. So that black line you see around it, I cut that with an X-Acto knife so that it disappears. And that gives me a perfect shape. And so normally I would do maybe like a top and a bottom and my radiuses are exactly the same and perfect. And if I do, that particular one was for, I think we did 12 jackets with the exact same logos on it. And it matched this logo that I showed earlier and so the radius needed to match this piece and then the same with a different word on top. And so doing it with die sub, I could nail it all down in Photoshop, print it out and actually lay it on the jacket and then just go ahead and just like I would do any die subbing shirts or anything else, I can make as many as I want. They're all gonna be exactly the same. And my base outline on the jackets was exactly the same as well. Uh, the character of the chain stitch is what people are really drawn to. And so you get a lot of variations and things and how that works. So I think that was kind of the cooler part, but the jackets themselves all looked the same. My daughter is really into Wings of Fire. It's a kid's book about dragons. So this is a jacket that I made for her. Um, this is also, I die sub this patch. This one was really complicated. Um, the colors and the patterns. This was one of my earliest ones that I did. And you can see all the rows of stitching. This patch probably took me about eight hours to stitch. And I actually did another one and got halfway through and I made some film mistakes and I started over. Um, and then Glory is the name of the dragon that she likes. And my daughter's name is Amelia. So it's a really great tool. Uh, the die sub, using it uh, with the stitching. This is my personal jacket, which is another die sub patch. This is my self-portrait, half pizza, half donuts. Um, so I don't want to keep beating that over and over again, but it's the chain stitch is one thing. It's its own tool that's very interesting and unique. But it was, I've been die subbing for about two years, which started out of... Uh, my background is a product designer and I've run a wood shop for about 25 years and I was designing things for people and we were sending them off to other shops to have made and the quality was just terrible. And I kind of stumbled onto Mr. Gross's videos about dye sublimation because at the time I was doing cut vinyl and I thought this looks great. And so I thought the, the entry point on the machines was good and I had an uh, inexpensive press and started making my own prototypes using die sub and it just turned my business upside down. I'm a stay at home dad. And so it's something that I could do in my spare time using the die sub. 
that press lasted about a week before I got my Geonite uh, 20S, which is a game changer. So being able to bring that side of my business and two years of experience doing die sub into the chain stitch, which I've only really been doing for about six months now, it, it's been amazing and a real boost into being able to do things that I think are a lot more complicated than I would probably have attempted without die sub helping me lay things out in a way that I understand. So that's kind of my evolution to these machines. And I'll move over here to this other machine. And you can see uh, my Sawgrass SG400 down there and my computer. This machine is called a post bed machine. And it is essentially the same machine as the Singer. This one is a Cornelli, which is uh, just a different brand. But the way that this machine works, it's very similar to um, what they would have at Disney when they would put your name on the mouse ears. So the top half of this machine is essentially the same machine as I was just showing you with the Singer. However, it has this post and this extension. What's going on under the machine is exactly the same. I've got my control handle here, my thread, the servo motor, that's all the same. But the other machine, because it's on a flat table, everything has to be flat that goes under that other machine. So before when I was doing stitching on sleeves or trying to do baseball hats, things like that, I was having to deconstruct them and then reconstruct them, which is expensive and time consuming. Versus with this machine, this is a, a jean jacket sleeve that I've just cut off. You simply feed it onto the machine. And you can do that if this was attached to the jacket, it would go either way. And this lets you stitch up complete garments without having to do any deconstruction. And then um, just real quick, I'll grab a couple of hats. Baseball hats are also something I do a lot of. And so um, with these, um, I'm from Atlanta. So this is an ATL hat. And you couldn't flatten this hat out enough to be able to stitch on, on the other machine. You can see this is all embroidered. But with this machine, you simply feed it on and direct stitch onto the hat. It's also really great for uh, attaching patches. So this patch is one that I made on the other machine and then just simply stitched it onto this hat using this machine. And I'll put this uh, sleeve back on here. And see, I was playing around earlier and doing a little flames coming out of the, the sleeve gusset there. But again, this works exactly the same. It's um, handle under here. Let me bring this camera over. Once again, apologize for all the jerky camera movements. So this is a different brand. And so it's got some different parts. It looks a little different. It essentially does exactly the same thing. So with this, I could write, draw, if I want to fill something in, just doing those, those circles again. A couple different ways to use this machine. A lot of people really like this look of the open chain. But if you uh, go back over your work a second time without your glasses on while on live camera, you can change the look of it so that it becomes more of a solid line and you can actually do a lot more drawing where you're not actually seeing so much of the chain stitch itself. So that's kind of an overview. I don't know, uh, Sprite, if we have any more questions or if there's something else I can show more samples. But that's a general overview of how I'm using the dice with these two machines. I think that was, I mean, that was awesome. That was awesome. That was, um, that was really cool. I really, <laughs> really enjoyed that. Um, you have, as Alice said, it's kind of a steampunk thing you have going on with the, um, with the machines. 
I love it. it. It's they're weird because I mean, this machine is a little bit older and very rare. Like there may be 15 of them in the U S they're just, they're hard to find. And I actually just bought this machine from Istanbul. Um, just because someone hasn't asked, I'll throw it out there. The, the post bed machine that I was just showing, which is a modified, that post is not the original post. Somebody has changed that. This machine costs about the same as a, a white toner printer. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And the singer that I'm working on is about the same as an SG-1000. Okay. So looking at it from the die sub world, the machine costs are similar. And so it's kind of, can you justify that with your business model and the products that you're putting out on the marketplace? Well, and your products are very high end, um, very high end. I can only imagine um, what you get for some of those jackets. Um, or I'm happy, to, I'm happy to discuss them there. Uh, they start at, not including the jacket, just the embroidery uh, would start around 130 and go up a lot. So um, this is a jacket I did for a plant shop here in town. This is their jacket and uh, it says Lush Plant Co. at the top. Embroidery on this jacket was um, just around $100. This jacket is my personal jacket that has my business logo on it. And you can see the level of detail in that stitching. Something like that would be closer to um, 250. To put names or things on the front, something like this is $15. I love it. That's that's great. That's awesome. Yeah, you're going to have to make me something. <laughs> <laughs> I really would be happy to. Awesome. Well, that was great. And I we kind of answered all the questions as we went along. And um, But yeah, uh, I want to thank you so very much. This is probably one of my favorite we webinar Wednesdays that we've done because I <laughs> learned so much. Um, well, good. And I love the machine. I could see uh, me doing it like right before I go to bed and it just knocking me out. Uh, you know what happens is after working on it all day, you, you start to like see things in circles. Yeah, being a designer, I see things in pixels, so I get it. <laughs> uh, I can't tell you how many times working on my computer, and I'm sure you've done this, where you see something that's not aligned and you try to select all and hit the align tool. The working on the chain stitch machines is the same way. Like you, you look at something and you see how it could be made out of circles. <laughs> yeah. That was awesome. All right, thank you so much. That was that was great. That was awesome. Um, once again, I want to thank you. Just this was great. This was awesome. This is I've got the big smile on my face. This was a great well, webinar good. Wednesday. So um, yeah, everybody should feel free to reach out to me too. I know that we've just kind of like a quick overview, but I love talking about these machines and I love talking about sublimation. So um, huckmade.com is the website. I'm on Instagram. Same thing. Um, please send me a note. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Well, I want to thank you again. I want to thank everybody for joining us. And I guess um, I'll see you all on Friday. So have a great week, guys. All right. Thanks, everybody, for watching.